Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Chad Fieser. Uh, Chad, if you'll put your, there we go. Chad Fieser has worked in training and education since 2007 and has worked with thousands of students of all ability levels. Chad is able to leverage his experience in educating professionals in new and extended technology skills. In addition to running the Red Hat Enterprise Linux Essentials course for Alta 3, Chad instructs the following courses, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Essentials, Python Basics, Network Automation with Python and Ansible, Python for Network Automation, APIs and API Design with Python, and Kubernetes Bootcamp. Chad is also the talent behind many of Alta 3's marketing videos, as well as being our in-house illustrator. He is also a constant contributor to our YouTube channel and our blog library. So with all that, I'm, I'm like the hype man for you, Chad. I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, everybody. I hope I'm coming through loud and clear. I see my mic is active. Brent, hey, am I sounding you, good? You sound great, Chad. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks, Brent. Well, hey, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Wherever you are in the world, I hope that you are well, and I hope that you are safe. Again, my name is Chad. So uh, we are going to talk today about just Kubernetes, why it's just exploding right now, and to deep dive into one of the more important features of it, which is how does Kubernetes handle networking? So I'm absolutely welcoming all of your questions that if you have them, go ahead and put them in the question and answer box. I do try to answer some on the fly because some questions make sense in the context of what it is that we're talking about at any given time. So otherwise, we'll take a look at that stuff at the end. So it's been my pleasure to be teaching Kubernetes for uh, some time now. And when I have folks that join me in my classroom, uh, often they're like not too sure what's Kubernetes all about. They know, hey, my boss wants me to learn this. Or, hey, all the big guys, Netflix and you know, uh, Amazon, they're all using Kubernetes, but how can that benefit my business? Well, just a couple of things that if you're working with Kubernetes, what you're doing is you're working with a free and open source container orchestrator. And using Kubernetes is the most recent, and most popular architecture that's available to manage containers, containerization of application, which is just the absolute new hotness when it comes to delivering content to market. And this is a revolution. It's just absolutely turning things upside down. And it's using something that we've had for so long containers. I'm quite sure that a lot of you out there have worked with Docker or other container runtimes, but as far as actually, you know, serving clients, containers, it wasn't really a feasible thing until we had architectures like Kubernetes come along. So what Kubernetes does is that it takes these containers, these microservices, and what they do, what they does is, is that it deploys them, it schedules them, and makes sure that they can talk to them and make sure that your clients can access them. And what that translates to mean and why microservices is just so exciting is that it delivers on a few really, really cool features. Instead of say, pushing a virtual machine or, you know, goodness forbid, a physical server, all right, releasing every six months, how about six releases every day? or being able to roll out failed uh, deployments, rolling back to a previous version, rolling out something to the client with zero downtime. There's a lot of reasons why this is just so exciting. Being able to quarantine things that are going wrong, it offers a whole lot of control. Kubernetes is also great as far as surprises or lack thereof is concerned. That when you have different departments, you've got your dev folks, you got your test folks, and then you have production. That may be three entirely different environments. And trying to migrate from one to the next is where a whole lot of problems can occur. But if everyone is working inside of the same environment, a Kubernetes cluster, migrating back and forth between dev to test to prod, it's virtually no effort whatsoever. And what's more, Kubernetes is designed to be so bulletproof, so flexible, 
right? That hardware failure can be a thing of the past in a well set up cluster. There's no guarantees, of course, but it enables uh, a lot of these really cool features. And if only we had time to discuss in detail what, how each of these work inside of a Kubernetes cluster, we'd have to spend all week together. <laughs> but uh, we can also just hit on the fact that a Kubernetes cluster allows you to control your resource consumption. See, Kubernetes with clusters, with containers, we can spin up containers from zero to infinity basically as fast as we want. Containers are small, they're quick, they're lean. We can create more or less depending on what our resource consumption is. When we're dealing with the cluster, which is a collection of nodes, a collection of physical or virtual machines, who's to say that you need a static number of those machines at any given time? Sometimes you need more, sometimes you don't need as much. You can spin capacity up and down. A cluster is an aggregate of resources. So for that reason, it's really, really exciting. It's also cloud agnostic. You can run this on any location, any hardware, any time of day. You can even run it on your own bare metal and it can interface with so many different clouds. So Kubernetes is really exciting. The infrastructure required in getting Kubernetes to run requires us to have microservices available, which again means containers a lot of them. And if we have a bunch of containers, which we've had the ability to make for such a long time now, how, what's different? What's different is, is that Kubernetes has this unparalleled ability to track, chart, control, communicate between containers uh, very, very easily. And what we're going to be talking about is just that. Now, something that uh, we need to know about Kubernetes is, is that there are two levels of certification for this, and I'm only offering this as context for what we're about to talk about. There is the certified Kubernetes application developer, which is a first level certification that you are competent with working inside of a cluster. And then there is the CKA, the certified Kubernetes administrator, that's the next level up, and that implies that you're you know, proficient in dealing with multiple clusters. But what we're gonna talk about is networking. And if I go to the bottom of this page here, and I can go ahead and drop this link down in the chat if anybody is uh, interested in taking a look. If I open up curriculum overview, and I open up uh, the most recent curriculum for the CKAD, this is what Kubernetes, which is backed by Google, would say is the most important things that basically your people, your team, need to be proficient in using in order to be considered, you know, like certifiably Kubernetes uh, proficient. And my goodness, it would take all week to go over all of these. But if you look down here in the 13%, of the uh, proficiency can be tracked back to how well do your people understand networking inside of a Kubernetes cluster? And that would involve understanding things that are called services. And that's not what you're thinking. If you're new to Kubernetes, services is an object in Kubernetes. And understanding uh, what network policies are. So that is also something else that is specific to Kubernetes. So what we're going to do today is that we're going to keep it high level and we are going to discuss what my students are always the most excited to talk about. They come in on the very first day. They are very excited and they want to know all about how do all these containers talk to each other, but they don't know anything else, of course. So this usually comes on day three of a typical classroom instruction but you guys all get a fast forward, okay? Which means that uh, for those of you that are new to Kubernetes, I'm gonna make sure that I'm keeping it on your level. And if you have any questions, please make sure that you're dropping them into the Q&A box, okay? All right, so what we're looking at here 
is a simplified version of this graphic that we're going to be looking at here. And here's what I'd like everybody to understand about the cluster that we're going to be working with. All right, what I have right here, this is our lab environment, which I'm just going to use to show you some things. What I've got listed here is a list of all of my nodes that are inside of a cluster. They're named node one, node two, node three, you see. And what each one of these nodes represents is a virtual machine that we have included inside of our cluster. Each of these nodes is its own virtual machine and any application that we have running inside of our cluster is going to be running on top of one of these nodes. Now, how do containers come into this picture? Well, if I pull up a quick and simple manifest, check it out. What Kubernetes does is, is that it really easily abstracts for us instructions on what we want our containers to look like and have running inside of them. This is a blueprint, a manifest for something that's called a pod. And what a pod is, is it's just basically the wrapper that goes around the container. So here we are launching a container that has such and such an image inside of it. So this is the application that we are looking to run. This is our microservice, right? But because we're in fast forward mode here, I'm actually going to take you to the next level, which is a deployment. If you look down here, check this out in the line that I have highlighted. Here you can see we've got our container, it's 888 SAM Webby. This is our microservice that we're looking to launch but we are creating it inside of something that's called a deployment. And what a deployment does is that it's going to create three pods for us, not just one, like I showed you earlier. And by creating this deployment, what I now have are three pods. See, one, two, three. All three of them were created by that deployment just now. And this is going to make sure that all of these pods are going to stay up and running at any given time. I just deleted one. Check again. Aha, that one's getting deleted, but check it out. A brand new one, this pod is taking its place. So this is illustrating just how flexible Kubernetes is. What does all of this have to do with networking. I'm getting there and uh, just wanna make sure that when I show you this graphic, you've at least seen the, the command line, what it is that I'm talking about. Right now, my deployment that I just made with all of these pods inside of it, they're still on private mode, so to speak. You can't communicate back and forth between them. No networking can really take place between them until they have been exposed. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and get a list of services. I only have one. Service is one of those objects that is essential to understand for understanding networking. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do cube control expose and I'm going to expose that deployment that I just made. The deployment that's named web service. It says that web service has been exposed. Let's get another list of those services again. Suddenly I got a new addition to my list. It's only six seconds old. This is a service called web service. And what this is doing is that it is exposing our deployment. So let me clear some space here a little bit. And what I'm using right now are called uh, cube control commands. And I'm going to describe in greater detail this one particular web service service. All right, name web service. Endpoints. You can see here, I've got one, two, three different IP addresses, okay? Let me get another list of my pods. And I'm gonna add this little dash O wide here to make sure that I can see what the IP addresses of each of these pods are. Zoom out a little bit. Okay, 192, 168, 103.3, 66.69, 232.70. Oh, check it out, 66.69, 232.70. Okay, so when I exposed my deployment, 
which was a collection of three pods. And each pod has its own unique IP address. Then those IP addresses are being tracked inside of that service. So let me show you one more cool thing about that, that if I were to delete another one of those pods again, let's get rid of this one. I just deleted that pod, which its IP address 232.70 is here inside of this service, right? Let's describe that service again. All right, 103.3, that's this right here. 66.69, that's this right here. 232.71, it's different than 232.70. Let me get another list of my pods here. This is my brand new pod, the one that took place, the one that just deleted. It's got a brand new IP address and look what happened. The service automatically updated itself so that this new pod and this deployment, its IP address was added to the service. So this is an important takeaway that I could delete all of these pods all day, every day, and every single time that one of these pods gets brought back, its IP address is going to be different, okay? Now, to answer some questions in the chat, are the three pods I just created different instances of the microservice? These are all identical, that what these are is, these are known as replicas. So that if I went to go back into my deployment manifest, I'm creating three replicas which means that each of those pods has the exact same image running inside of it. Reason why is because this creates a high availability circumstance that if one of those pods goes down and this is the application that my customer needs, no problem, I still got two more. And that pod that went down, it's gonna spin up another one to take its place. So this is uh, very exciting. Anybody who had to get up in the middle of the night to restart something because it went down will love Kubernetes, right? Now, how are the IPs being signed? That is an incredibly in-depth conversation. And uh, it also depends on what type, of, um, what type of network plugin it is that you're using. That if we look here in this cluster, one of the most popular types of uh, network plugins that are out there is called Calico. And short and simple answer because we don't have, <laughs> I wish we did, but we don't have lots and lots of time, is that this network plugin Calico, that's what's responsible for assigning the IP addresses. That's what's responsible for basically communicating those IP addresses across the rest of the cluster, All right? So hopefully there we've got maybe a little bit more of an idea of what are nodes. Nodes are all of the virtual machines that are running inside of our cluster, okay? So picture each of these columns right here as a different machine. Inside of each of these machines, each of these nodes, we have access to a service which is what we just made at the command line. That type of service is called a cluster IP. And that cluster IP, that service, is pointing, essentially, to all of the pods it's keeping track of. When we were all uh, looking at the command line earlier, we saw that we had three pods, right? They were all replicas of each other. They were all identical. And that one service, that one cluster IP service had the IP address of each pod. So in understanding external traffic in uh, Kubernetes, understand this, that the final goal is to just get down to the IP address of the pod. If we had that, then we'd be good to go. All right, some questions. How do we access the pods as their IP is changing? That's a great question because some of you might be thinking, holy cow, that is a nightmare. If the IP address keeps changing, how are we ever going to keep track of it? How could this insanity possibly work out? Well, 
that's what we're about to talk about. And that is uh, very, very interesting how it does it. So what we're looking at are four different hops, four different jumps. And here's our little warning that until you get it, quote unquote, this can seem outrageously complex. And I'm going to be throwing a lot of terms at you guys. So if you need any clarification on any of them, just uh, let me know. Okay. All right. So here we've got a more exploded version of what it is we were looking at earlier. And I'd like to describe what it is that we're seeing on this screen first. Okay. All right, so here you can see we've got three pods, right? And we can see that each of these pods are on top of three different nodes. So each of these pods are located on top of three different nodes. And that is as it should be in Kubernetes. If I've got, do I want all my eggs in one basket? Do I want all of my pods just be piled onto one node, make that one node very busy while all the other nodes are like kind of twiddling their thumbs? No, absolutely not. So by default, pods will be kind of spaced out across nodes as best they can. So this is a very common situation. Each of these pods are replicas. They're all part of the same deployment, but they're all on different nodes. If we go back to our command line here, you can see these are my three pods. One is on top of node one, one is on top of node two, one is on top of node three. We all understand that each of these pods are exactly the same. They just have a slightly different name, right? So here's the goal that our client up here is sending a get request and they want access to our application which is inside of this container, let's say. And somehow we gotta get from here down to here, or down to here, or down to here. That's the end goal. So I find that explaining this makes the most sense going from bottom up and then from top down to bottom. All right. so. Got some questions about uh, the IP addresses and uh, like how are they different? They are different. That's exactly what I'm about to talk about right now. All right, so we've got our pods. Each one of these pods has their own unique IP address, right? They're all different. And all of these pods, like I showed you earlier when I created that service, the IP addresses of all of these pods are being watched by that service. So when you're picturing what a service is, picture it as just a big old hairy eyeball, right? It's with some nice big long lashes, there we go. It's constantly keeping an eye on the IP addresses of the pods so that if those pods go down or if more pods are added, the service watches everything. The service knows everything. It'll always keep an eye on those pods and their IP addresses, no matter what happens to them, okay? So our service, which is a cluster IP service, is just one of many, right? Inside of a cluster, we could have hundreds, thousands of pods, which means we could have hundreds, thousands of services keeping track, watching those pods at any given time, right? Now the thing about a service is, is that a service, it has its own IP address. Here if we're describing the service that we made together just a little bit ago, these are the IP addresses of the pods it's watching, but this is the IP address of the service itself. So earlier when I said, we've got four IP addresses here, right? There's the IP address of the pod, there's the IP address of the service. And then later there's gonna be the IP address of the node and of the load balancer. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute, okay? Now, 
this service is just one of many. So it's in a subnet range of service IP addresses. So somewhere in the 172.16.3. whatever range, okay? So if the service is what points to the pods, what points to the correct service? If we could have, let's say, hundreds or thousands of services, like I was telling you earlier, how is it that we know which one is the one that we need? Well, up at this level, now we're at level two, we will have reached one of these nodes. And just take it for granted when I say it at this point, it doesn't matter which node I choose. I'm just choosing node three because why not? Okay, you know what? I'll go with node two, just to prove it doesn't matter. So if I'm over here at node two, when I arrive at that node, I'm going to have two different things. I'm going to have the IP address of that node. And I'm also a left-handed person trying to write with a right-handed mouse. So apologies for that. There is also this thing that's called a node port. And a node port is a uh, five digit number that's always gonna fall in this range, 30,000 between that and 32,767, all right? So a node port is always going to be a number somewhere inside of that range. Here's the significance of the node port. The node port is what maps which of these services do we, uh, do we need here? Which one of these services is the pointer that's gonna send me to one of these pods, right? So let's get rid of all that for a second. What we need is we need to get to one of these three nodes. It doesn't matter which one, right? What I'm talking about, these are our three different virtual machines right now, right? Each of these virtual machines, they have their own specific IP address. They all have their own unique IP address. And what is responsible for choosing which one of those nodes do we go to is the load balancer, all right? Now, Kubernetes is open source, as I've mentioned previously. And open source means that, uh, well, it's not required to provide everything that you need. And in order for Kubernetes to actually work, you do need to use a lot of third party programs in order to keep it up and running. Uh, one of them would include a load balancer. So we use Envoy for our load balancers in uh, our clusters that we use. And this is what our load balancer does. Round Robin, it's gonna choose one of these nodes. Doesn't matter which. It's totally round robin. If the last time that it sent some get request from a client earlier, it sent it down here to node one, well then the load balancer is gonna send the next get request to node two, or the next time it's gonna go node three and then so on and so forth, right? So at this level, we are just load balancing across however many nodes we have inside of our cluster. And <clears throat> to anybody who is, whose brain is starting to just explode at this point, you're not alone because this kind of concerted madness is just kind of how it works. All right. So now that we're at the top, we're going to work our way back down again. And uh, I am keeping an eye on the chat. Some folks are asking, uh, so how do these nodes communicate with each other? Again, the answer is which network plugin are you using? The network plugin that we use is called uh, Calico. And Calico is uh, one of the more popular ones out there because it uses border gateway protocol, which is just, you know, what holds the internet together. So for that reason, Calico is much celebrated for its direct and powerful uh, control. Now, let's go back up here to the top. And we are Joe Schmo. Uh, user, right? We're client. And we are sending a get request through a browser and we are trying to access such and such a program. Let's say that it's called Webby. 
First thing that we're going to do is that we are sending our get request to an external facing IP, which is our load balancer. So the load balancer is the point of ingress. It is the point of communication between this, our cluster and the public internet or other clusters. All right, it's the difference. It's basically the gateway between inside the cluster and outside of the cluster. The load balancer is being asked to send this get request. Does the load balancer know where Webby is? No, of course not. The load balancer only knows two things. It knows the location of each one of these nodes it knows the IP addresses of each of these nodes. And it also knows what the master is whispering inside of its ear. Now, if you're new to Kubernetes, the master is the master node, what's in charge of communicating with the entire cluster. It is the master that is going to provide the load balancer with the node port. And the node port, remember, is what's going to get us to the service that we need. So the load balancer, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Which one of these nodes am I going to go? Let's say it goes zzzt down here to node two. So the load balancer has the IP address of this node, and it selects that node, round robin style. When it gets to that node, there is going to be a node port that is open on top of it. Let's say that the node port is, oh, I don't know, 31,234. That 31,234 node port is open on all three of these nodes. So I just wanna make sure that it's clear. Whichever one of these nodes the load balancer chooses, doesn't matter, does not matter at all. Any one of these would have been fine. The load balancer just happened to choose node two. All right, so when we get to node two, we have this whole subnet range of service IP addresses, okay? Remember, the service, that's the big hairy eyeball that knows where all of the uh, pods are. It knows the IP addresses of all the pods. How do, we, how do we know which one of these services is the one that we need? Which eyeball do we need? <laughs> Don't forget, that is what the node port does. That the node port is directing us specifically to which one of these IP addresses is the one that we need. Uh, excuse me, which, yeah, which one of these uh, service IP addresses is the one that we need. So we found our service. Hello everyone. It seems like we're having a little audio and video difficulty right now. Um, I think perhaps Chad's connection got cut. Uh, so we'll give him, give him just a moment here and, and hopefully he's able to hop back on. You know, our presenter is, is generally one of the most important things in our webinars. So <laughs> we'll give him a moment or two here. Uh, just want to again reiterate, thank you so much for all your fantastic questions so far and, uh, and for putting them in the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm just getting word that Chad lost power and he's coming back on. So um, again, one of the one of the joys of working remotely these days. I'm sure we've all had some some good stories over the over the past few months of losing power and um, having the unexpected happen. Um, so again, as Chad's coming back on, just a few uh, a few quick reminders. Um, you will receive a copy of this 
uh, recording in about a week. Um, it is a recording of the presentation, not the slide deck itself. So it's a recording of our presentation and it will be edited. So you won't have to hear me uh, blabbering about stuff in the Q&A and all that stuff. Only hey, the good thing that you came for. All right, so, so Chad's back and joining us. Chad, thanks for coming back, man. You're, you're probably the most important part of this webinar. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely my pleasure. <laughs> thanks everyone for your patience. I'll turn it back over to you, Chad. Yeah, of all times to have a power surge, right? Well, I'm sure everybody here can sympathize. All right, uh, so where were we? We were talking about um, what's going on when we have reached the, uh, when we've reached the cluster IP uh, subnet level. So we have selected the correct uh, service, which is our eyeball that's pointing to each of our pods, right? Now, Here's the next question. Which one of these pods is it that I am supposed to select? If each of these pods is, a, is exactly the same, then which one of these three should I go to? Well, first of all, this is, a really, this is exactly the situation that we want to have. If I have a ton of traffic that's coming into my cluster, do I want to have just one pod all by its lonesome being the one that uh, has to answer every single get request? By having more replicas, in other words, basically devoting more resources to having more replicas of this pod up and running, then that means that we've got more uh, people. <laughs> that means that we've got more uh, instances of this uh, application up and running. So we are able now to load balance across our pods. Send one request to this pod, then send the next request to this pod, and then send the third request to this pod, and so on and so forth. So obviously that's advantageous, but to understand, okay, well, what is responsible for, you know, load balancing across each of those replicas, what we're talking about is an entity that's called cube proxy. So cube proxy is a, basically a program that lives on each of the nodes. It gets installed when you add that node to the cluster. The cube proxy is what is looking at the service, all right? And it's telling the client, okay, you're the third client to make this request today. That means I'm gonna send you to pod number three. And then the next client who comes in, like, okay, I went to pod three last time, now you're gonna to go to pod number one, right? And so on and so forth. So we actually have two levels of load balancing that's going on here, all right? In order to ensure the following, that each of our nodes is sharing in the duty of making sure that this traffic is being handled. And we also have load balancing down at the uh, service level that is making sure that our replicas are being load balanced across as well. All right. Now, as for what is the role of master, as far as like this, master is obviously integral in order for a uh, cluster to work. But for the sake of this conversation, master only enters into it as master is where all the information about the cluster is being stored. The, cluster, the master knows where each of these pods are, right? It knows each of those locations. So it's the master that basically is responsible providing to the load balancer, which node port are you going to use? Now this begs the question that if the master knows what the IP addresses of all these pods are, why are we even bothering with this nonsense in the first place? Why not just put all of the IP addresses of every single pod in the cluster inside of the load balancer, and then just let the load balancer handle it? Why not let the load balancer just send that traffic straight down to the pod, right? You could do that, but nobody in their right mind ever would because what you've just done is you've just created an awful bottleneck situation 
that your traffic is being, you know, routed across your cluster only as quickly as your load balancer is able to do it. All right. And let's not also forget that pods, they live, they die, they get reborn, they're given new IP addresses all the time. But a Kubernetes cluster is constantly in flux and trying to keep track of all that is really just a nightmare. So to give you a more colorful and uh, more numerical uh, explanation of everything it is that I just showed you, let's take another look at the exact same concept. This time, let's actually see the numbers. So if I'm making a uh, request to a service. Let's say that I want to access a company's uh, book or video or whatever. I'm typing in a URL address. And what that's doing is, is that it is entering into my cluster via the load balancer, which we use Envoy. The load balancer is going to go across every single node inside of the entire cluster. It doesn't matter which node, right? At this point, they're all the same. Whatever node it winds up accessing, it's going to do so via a node port, which is this five digit number, okay? That node port is pointing directly to the service that contains those pods that I'm looking for. I'm trying to find book, right? Well, this is the service that has the IP addresses, the pods that contain book. So this is the IP of the service. You can see that I've got three pods, three replicas over here. The cube proxy is gonna do its thing and it's gonna say eeny, meeny, miny, mo. which one of these identical replicas to which I should go? Boom, let's go to this pod right here, which is this IP address right there. At that point, we've completed our journey that we have completed external ingress into the cluster. And once you understand that much, then you can start to understand how internal traffic works as well. That if one of these pods needs to communicate with say another pod, then all of that is done through services as well. That if a pod is gonna reach another one, it's gonna to go to that other pod service, which is then in turn gonna direct it to whichever pod it needs. So, <clears throat> All of networking in Kubernetes works this way. And this level of depth of understanding is absolutely abstracted and handled for us automatically, auto-magically. Not saying you don't need to know this stuff. And if you intend to pass the CKAD, then you totally should. But for day-to-day -day use, for ease of day-to-day -day use, so much of Kubernetes is automated for us. And it makes things so much easier. All right, so as I had spoken before that when you are dealing with uh, the level of proficiency that is expected to be provided by a CCAD level certification, what we've talked about is the gist of services. And I'm sure that you guys have plenty more questions about how they work. This is often a conversation that can take hours just to answer questions to people's satisfaction. Um, but as far as the second bullet point, demonstrating understanding of network policies, not to mention all the other objects that exist inside of Kubernetes, as a friendly uh, heads up to anybody who's planning on achieving this certification, it's gonna take a lot of practice and it's gonna take a lot of familiarity. It's gotta be in your fingers. It's got to be total muscle memory because taking the CCAD, I can tell you from experience, is uh, it's, they make you earn it and that is for sure. So what I'd like to show you before we open it up to just open questions is to talk about one other feature that's involved in Kubernetes networking, which is called a network policy. All right, so what I'm showing you here is what we use our tools to teach uh, folks about Kubernetes and get them to uh, CCAD level certification skills is that we are going to play around a little bit with our um, environment. And what we're gonna do is you guys are gonna watch me create two pods. This first pod that I'm making is called client. And inside of client, 
I'm going to delete this one line namespace here. It's going to have a label attached to it called run client. Trying to keep track of all of your pods, like I've just showed you how all these pods are trying to communicate with each other. Keeping track of all those can be an absolute nightmare, which is why so much of Kubernetes relies on labels in order to identify, track, isolate, target pods inside of its cluster. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create that pod called client. I'm now going to create another pod called client 02. And client 02 here is identical to the first one, except look here, the label says run client 02. This is a different label. Otherwise, totally identical. It has a different name for the pod, but everything inside of the pod is the same. Okay. And I'm going to create that pod as well. And I'm now going to run a, uh, oh, it's complaining because it's saying, hey, that namespace doesn't exist. That's cool because we're demonstrating I'm not going to bother I'm not ruining this environment. This is just a command line uh, solution that I just made a pod named Nginx that has this in image Nginx running inside of it. All right. If I go back in here and I get rid of this line, now it will work. Okay, so I now have these three pods that I've created for this lab. Client, Client02, and Nginx, including the three that I made earlier, but we can just ignore those for now. What I'm about to do is that I am going to expose that Nginx pod what happens when I do this commit, when this command is that I just created a new service and now this pod, Nginx, is available. It can now be communicated with in the exact same, following the lecture that we all just witnessed together. This is the IP address of this uh, service and that if I were to describe that service, this is the IP address of the Nginx pod. Because that service exists, this pod IP address can be discovered, which means that other pods can communicate with it. So if I were to run this command right here, this is what's happening. I am executing a command inside of my pod called client. We made that earlier in the lab, right? And what this string is saying is, is that we're gonna run a wget on the main page of Nginx, okay? Nginx being a web server. And what I'm getting is, welcome to Nginx, okay? This is just the placeholder page for Nginx. If I were to delete that service, by the way, and I were to try to run that command again, you can see that it doesn't work. Why? Because I'm trying to have client access a pod that it doesn't know how to find. Nginx is not exposed, therefore I am not going to be able to access it. Now to fast forward a little bit, because we do have 10 minutes remaining, uh, I don't wanna keep anybody over time and uh, I just get excited about talking about this stuff. Let me show you one other thing that is used in Kubernetes to control networking, which is an object that's called a network policy. And what a network policy does is that it is enabling us to control what pods are able to talk to each other. What pods can have ingress, meaning traffic coming in, and which pods can have egress, meaning traffic going out? Everything on this list right here is allowed ingress and egress. Oh, wait a minute. There is literally nothing inside of this white list right here. So in other words, all the pods that are allowed ingress and egress, yeah, there's none. That's why this is called a default deny network policy so that if I were to apply this network policy now, and I attempt to run that exact same command again, which we all just saw work not that long ago, you can now see that it's hanging. 
The reason why is, is because the, uh, the white list on that network policy is, does not include this client pod inside of it. So this is never going to work and I'm just gonna go ahead and cancel that right now. So what I would need to do in order to fix this is that I would have to go back inside of my policy here and basically change the spec, which is the specification of how I would like this to run. Oops. To include that pod. There we go. Let's allow ingress from pods that match the label run client. Does that label sound familiar? Cause it should, if I go back up here, you can see that's the label that's on top of our client pod that we made earlier and that we are permitting it to have traffic with our Nginx pod. So let's apply that change and let's see if that worked now. There you go. So by creating a network policy, which as you can see is a not super complicated um, Kubernetes object, what this is doing is, is that's enabling us to control how does traffic work between our pods inside of a given cluster. So exposing those pods in, via services is what opens them up to communicate. But also part of that is understanding, okay, just because things are exposed and able to communicate, should they be permitted to do so? So in a nutshell, that's basically the level of understanding that's expected to be had for these two bullet points right here in the CCAD exam. So it's definitely very interesting and uh, it's definitely a head scratcher to get started. But uh, I certainly enjoyed teaching it and I uh, hope that this at least pierced the mystery a little bit of how pods are able to find each other and how we can control what pods and containers can communicate. All right, so with about five minutes remaining, we can go ahead and uh, open this up to uh, any questions that you folks have. Sure, hey, uh, awesome. Thank you, Chad. I really huh? appreciate you uh, joining us today. I know we had a little bit of technical difficulties and. I know no one else knows this, but Chad's actually on vacation right now. He's, he's doing this from vacation, so truly appreciate it. Um, so we're going to start with our, uh, our Q&A. Um, again, I've enabled the upvote feature. Uh, we probably have time for you know, two, maybe three questions at the most. So if you see a question you really want answered, give it a little thumbs up. Um, I keep getting questions about the recorded session. Yes, you will receive this recording in about a week. Um, okay, so um, very first one here for you, Chad. So are these nodes communicating via open switch or something like it? These nodes are communicating through whatever, uh, like I mentioned before, whatever network plugin it is that you choose to incorporate in your cluster. That in order for a cluster to work, I had mentioned hey, Kubernetes doesn't provide its load balancer, Envoy. This is just the one that we choose to use. So Kubernetes is B-Y-O-L-B, bring your own load balancer. It's also bring your own network plugin. So when I was showing the command line earlier, when we were looking at uh, these Calico pods that are running inside of our cluster, Remember that a pod has containers and containers are applications. So Calico, what I have highlighted on my screen is a network plugin application that it's running at all times in order to ensure that our nodes can find each other. It, Calico does so by using a bird, uh, the bird daemon and uh, it enables nodes to be discovered via BGP. So like in the most nutshelliest of nutshells, that is what I would say is the answer to that question. Depends very much on your network plugin. Awesome, thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. um, so the next one here, uh, node is VM and pod is Docker container, right? Uh, yeah, really good question. So a node can be a virtual machine or it can be a physical machine. It can be a physical disk. You could go, in fact, you could go onto YouTube right now and you could watch videos of people who build clusters 
just using Raspberry Pis, like those just very little little machines. Those are physical machines, and uh, each of those represents a node inside of a cluster. It can be a virtual machine or it can be physical, and it can be a combination of the two. As for pods, a pod is a Kubernetes um, is a Kubernetes object. So if I did kube control get pods, this is me telling my uh, cluster, give me a list of all of my pods. I could not go kube control get containers, for instance. It doesn't know what I'm talking about. Kubernetes is just an orchestrator that the containers are still being made by Docker or they can be made by like container D or they can be made by like GCRIO, I mean, by default, Kubernetes works with Docker in order to create the containers that Kubernetes orchestrates, but it doesn't have to be. And in fact, if you are going to be using Calico, you're actually going to be using container D because that is just what that network plugin demands in order for it to work. Perfect. Okay. Well, we've got time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we, we could probably take one more. Um, we have a ton of questions still out there um, that we're not going to get to. Um, but just a friendly reminder, hit up Global Knowledge on any of our social platforms, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever. I mean, we, let, let's make those folks earn their paychecks. All right. Any questions you may have, reach out to them. They can get answers for you. Um, so uh, for a last question for you, Chad, then we'll let you off the hook. You can go back to a uh, sipping adult beverages on the beach here. Um, so, uh, so load balancing is always round robin, never uses any other criteria? Load balancing is yes, typically round robin. But if you are looking to bypass the round robin, what again, if we had all the time in the world, we could talk about how there are many different kinds of services that are out there. The one that we saw was a cluster IP service that goes load balancer to any one of these nodes, all right, uh, which then goes to a cluster IP, which then might go to a pod inside of an entirely different node. That's called a cluster IP service. If I had a node port service, which is going to hard code the node port, so I'm cutting master out of it entirely, I can pick and choose myself, which one of these nodes do I want to go to and then go straight down into that service inside of that node. So in that way, uh, you can bypass uh, the whole load balancing situation. You can manually choose which one of those nodes you want to go to. And uh, so a lot of people do that because it makes external communication go quicker if you target exactly where it is that you want to go. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chad. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and, and thank you to everyone that has uh, joined us today. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, and I, I know we've, we've seen a lot of questions come in here. Um, these are the uh, recommended courses. Chad, if you wouldn't mind advancing there. Oh, I'm sorry? Uh, to the uh, recommended courses. There, there we go. go. On the screen, these are what we recommend. You know, kind of next steps here. I, I saw a lot of questions come through where people are saying you know, they're beginners, kind of novices to this. Kubernetes Bootcamp is a great thing to jump into to give you a little bit more insight into things. Um, and as an attendee of today's webinar, we want to make it easy for you to take the next step. So you can either use a discount code uh, webinar25 in the US and uh, CA webinar25 in Canada. Um, and that will give you 25% off your next uh, Global Knowledge class. So uh, finally, be sure to continue to visit the Global Knowledge website to access additional free resources like technical articles, white papers, and webinars like this one. So uh, happy hand washing. Chad, enjoy the rest of your vacation. And everyone else, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.